Women Worldwide with Deirdre Breckenridge introduces incredible stories shared by women across the globe who have experienced the great heights of success and, at times, the agony of defeat. With a vision to impart wisdom and advice on how to tackle barriers and sort of new heights, the show uncovers different perspectives to help you find your inner strength and to power up your own voice so you can excel in life. Welcome to Women Worldwide. I'm your host, Deirdre Breckenridge. On the show, we've talked a lot about women, uh, women in business, the gender gap. We've gone into equality in the workplace, relationships with men, uh, a lot of what women are thinking and their perspectives of what's going on. But now correct me if I'm wrong, not once have we shared our ideas and perspectives about men and how they're feeling about masculinity in the 21st century, because there is definitely a shift in culture and society. Uh, we made history with Hillary Clinton accepting the nomination for the president of the United States. So we're seeing women come into power in politics and in business. And there's definitely a different dynamic in the home when it comes to shared responsibilities. Well, my special guest today has a lot to say, and he's excited to share his perspective with you about men and their shift. And joining me on the show is Jack Myers. He's the founder of MediaVillage.com, and he's also the author of the book, The Future of Men. Jack, it's great to have you on my show. Welcome. Oh, it's terrific to be here with you. Thank you. You're welcome. There, there is so much excellent information in your book, I've I've earmarked certain chapters so that I can go back to fully absorb it. Um, and you've written several books, but I'm I'm really dying to know what was the inspiration behind this latest book, The Future of Men. Well, the inspiration really is personified by uh, the nomination of Hillary Clinton and and the incredible way that this selection is personifying the cultural conflict. Uh, that we're experiencing in society today, uh, the conflict between uh, the, uh, the past patriarchal society and this young generation of young people uh, who are just coming into their adult years, which is the first generation, uh, I think, ever really to, to grow up in a, uh, a non-patriarchal uh, society. Uh, this is a generation who are now, uh, they're, 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 the way I describe them is they're, they're a generation that is anchored at one end uh, in, the mille, in the millennial generation, but is anchored at the other end squarely in the future in, in what we're calling the Z generation. So they're like 18 to 26 years old, and they have a, a completely different set of proposals perspectives about gender norms and gender relationships. Uh, they've grown up in a society where uh, 40% of their homes have been fatherless. Uh, they've grown up in a society where most of their teachers have been uh, women, where in, in college, 60% uh, of their classmates have been female in high school and college, where the women uh, are increasingly outperforming the men uh, among the under 30 generation, and this is a statistic that shocks a lot of people in the under 30 generation, uh, young people, uh, women are actually out earning men in large cities by as much as 20 percent nationally by uh, 8 percent. And in the under 30 workforce, more than 60 percent are female. So we're, we're really seeing this enormous shift. And as I, uh, I had written a book uh, in, that was published in 2012 called Hooked Up, A New Generation Surprising Take on Sex, Politics, and Saving the World. And in that book, I really identified this emergence of women among this uh, new generation. And what I kept getting asked were, well, what's happening to the men? Why are the men... <laughs> Uh, going to college in lower numbers. Why aren't they earning as much? Uh, what's the core difference? I didn't have answers, so I set out to find those answers. And, and that led me to these really interesting insights uh, about today's young men. Well, I thought the stats and the insights were really amazing. And, and some, like you said, were shocking. So you have this 
enormous shift. You have this millennial and the future um, living the shift, but you also have, and, and I, I was particularly interested in one of the chapters where you had mentioned in the book that men, um, and the, these are older generations, a good part of their lives, they are told to man up and mm-hmm. to be a man. Um, and really recognize big boys don't cry. Yeah, yeah, big boys don't cry. It's a macho stereotype. It gets handed down from generation to generation. So with that, with these men who are also living in society and seeing a different shift in, in culture, um, how are they turning the page to be more maybe empathetic? And, you know, are they doing it easily, which I doubt. And I'm sure there's challenges. So maybe you could speak to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. The, there's uh, there's really two worlds here that that we're seeing, and, and it's a it's a conf- two conflicting worlds. One are the are the men who are who are uh, rebelling, who are who are saying, "Come on, be tough, stand up, let's let's face down these uh, challenges from women," and seeing it as as an a- adversarial conflict, women versus men. But more and more men are really moving toward more feminine qualities. They're open and eager to be, to uh, accept more vulnerability in their lives, to, to learn how to be more emotionally open, to learn how to make uh, connections uh, that are built on, on emotions, collaboration, uh, being together. Uh, they're more open to LGBT. They're more open to uh, women taking positions like the presidency, and and in fact, seeing uh, a number of positives in in the in that shift. And more and more men are are feeling empowered to support that. Uh, the reality is, though, that that you look at uh, someone who's 20 years old today, and they've grown up with conflict and adversarial uh, relationships and, and polarization their whole lives. They've grown up with media images in commercials and TV sitcoms of, of men as the buffoon, the idiot, not able to change a diaper or wipe up a spill, uh, the butt of the jokes. Uh, while we, we're seeing messages toward women the, the, of empowerment, of, of ability to be and do anything they want. Um, and, and so we're seeing this, um, this conflict uh, in young men, but from that, be a man, man up, uh, big boys don't cry versus be more vulnerable, be more emotionally open. So while women have, have been given through a very positive message from media and the women's movement of empowerment, uh, young men have been, and men of all ages have been given a very conflicting message of who and what we should be. And I think we have to be very clear uh, that it's uh, okay uh, to be more vulnerable. It's okay to accept these changes in our lives and in fact positive, but also to create a new narrative about what is the role of a man in, in today's life, in a marriage, in the family, um, in, in relationships, in the job, uh, and, and how, to, how to act. And, and we're not being given that same kind of guidance uh, that women are being given by the women's movement. Yeah, um, I'd like to touch on the, the media part of it. And how much the media actually sinks in um, in terms of, you know, you had talked about the commercials changing. I specifically remember the, the beer commercials, how they change. Oh, my I also, God. Right? Yeah. Oh. And, and, you know, maybe you don't think about it. Um, but when you call that out in the book, you can really see the change there. And also... I want you to touch a little bit on the role models, too, in the TV shows, how they've changed. So maybe you could just speak a little bit more on that with the media and role models. And sure. Media commercials. Well, think, think back. You mentioned the beer commercials. Think back to the Budweiser was up commercial of, you know, men communicating with one word and, and it being all they need or the uh, the old Milwaukee beer with the Swedish uh, bikini team, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of men being together as a single cohort of men with men. Uh, the only thing that could make it better, better is a Swedish bikini team uh, uh, parachuting in or, right. or uh, skiing in um, of, of a, a Coors commercial with uh, a recent commercial with uh, men gathered uh, in, in a in a bar with with a beautiful 
women serving them and a woman scaling the, the cold cliffs to uh, open a hatch to uh, deliver a couple of beers. Um, you know, these are, these are images that objectify, teach objectification, uh, teach sexism, um, and teach that men, uh, men's best friends are men uh, to be served by women. And, and then in television, you know, look at the, the number of sitcoms where the, uh, the, the iconic TV dad of the last 20 years has been Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin <laughs> of the family guy. And of the last 40 years, God help us, it's been Bill Cosby. Uh, right. So, um, you know, there, there are so few positive role models. Now, we're beginning to see a change in that. Uh, there's a really a wonderful commercial uh, from Chase, where the dad dresses up as a fairy to be with yes. his dad as in, a, in a party. But most of these commercials that we're seeing are uh, fathers with their daughters. We're not really seeing commercials of those po- with those positive types of images of dads uh, with their sons. And we're also uh, there's also a wonderful commercial for Johnson and Johnson where. Uh, with an, a male nurse uh, uh, giving a shot to a, a young female patient uh, with cancer, and that, he's a, that he's that's Tom, and he's a real nurse, and mm-hmm. and that's his you know that's his real bedside manner, and that that's one of the first po- positive portrayals of a man in a nurse's role, and we're beginning to see some of those types of positive images like in Nurse Jackie and, and other shows uh, where men are in those those ro- positive roles where uh, taking, like just like we empower women to be in the STEM careers, uh, the science and technology and engineering careers, we, we need to empower men to, through media messaging, commercials, TV shows, uh, to be in the admin, the heel, the health, the uh, education, as teachers, uh, literacy, uh, and um, uh, those types in secretarial careers. Uh, so we, we, the media has a huge role here uh, to begin uh, rejecting the uh, image, the negative images of men, just as we've. Uh, been taught and learned and been encouraged and, and uh, motivated to uh, shift the perception of women through media and commercials as Dove has had, has done with the body image commercial and as always has done with the uh, uh, throw like a uh, throw like a girl commercial. Oh yeah, that that's actually one of my favorites. So I think they did a great job with that and the Dove as well. Do you think that um, young men who, you know, whether millennial or even this future generation growing up with the newer role models, seeing the positive commercials, like you pointed out with Johnson and Johnson, the male nurse, some of the shows that show men shifting and, and taking different roles, will it be a lot easier for them when it comes to relationships and how to have better relationships with women? Because it was really scary at one point in your book where men, relationships with women, what they learned, it was like deny, 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 lie, lie at all costs. What does the future have to look forward to? I would hate, you know, I, I, I see well, the shift. Uh, you know, in, in reality, it can only get better. Uh, Good. <laughs> 85, 85% of the long-term heterosexual relationships that end, 85% are ended by the women. Uh, for, um, there are three times as many unmarried, young and middle-aged women uh, today as there were um, in, uh, in 1970. There are 45% almost of of uh, young and middle-aged women today who are single, and that includes obviously divorcees, um, separations, uh, and and that's leading to more and more fatherless homes um, and and role models of of young people growing up today are increasingly dominated by uh, by women. So yes, these these young men are are much better prepared uh, to be better dads, to be better. Um, uh, to be better uh, husbands, partners, lovers, and and that's 
doesn't mean that they don't ne- still need positive role models and, and guides to help mm-hmm. them. We, you know, we, we, we all know the story. Men don't like to take directions when yeah. we're driving. Right. But the, good, the, the good news is we now have GPS in our cars. Uh, <laughs> exactly. but, you know, we <laughs> but we don't have GPS for relationships. We don't have GPS guides for careers. And, you know, what, what men have had in the past has been the fraternities, the old boys networks. Well, these have proven to be uh, increasingly destructive and mm-hmm. inappropriate in today's world. So we really need women to women's groups, women's organizations to really embrace young men also and recognize that the young people uh, coming out of college today, out of high school today, have grown up in a multicultural society, in a gender neutral world where, uh, whether it's online or in their schools or in their homes where they don't really recognize, uh, that same type of those, those gender differences that my generation grew up with and, and that the X gen and Y gen and mo- most of the millennials have grown up with. This is a new generation that looks at their relationships, uh, with others, uh, in, in a much more open and uh, non-hierarchical and and non-gender defined or culturally or ethnically or religiously defined world. Um, So we need to really empower them and embrace them and accept them for who they are and actually learn from them uh, rather than trying to educate them on reality or bring them into the, the traditional uh, hierarchies in business. Uh, we, we need to change uh, the way we the way we structure our leadership programs, our training programs, our life guides, um, and, and embrace uh, what they're bringing to us rather than trying to uh, force them into uh, to our our worlds. I agree. I, I think they bring a lot of positive and direction with them. But what do they do? So, for example, you know, they're they're being shaped by everything, this shift, and it is positive. And they're seeing a, a lot that many of the older generations weren't they weren't exposed to clearly mm-hmm. based on mm-hmm. their family and, you know, their own role models. But so these these young men and these women get into the workplace and they they want to build relationships but you still have either something systemic within the institution that isn't recognizing a shift in power Mm -hmm. how do they actually function how do they handle an existing structure how do you break barriers Or, or how does that business relate to these young professionals so that they don't leave um and you lose the best talent well, that, that's a great, great question and a really important one for organizations, whether they be for-profit or non-profit, uh, recognize as, as they look to acquire the talent uh, from this uh, new generation and, and retain them. There's a generation that comes into organizations with a very different perspective than past generations. They're the, the first generation to grow up not believing they're going to be more financially successful than their parents mm. uh, since the Great Depression. They, they, they're looking for, they're motivated by uh, other things other than money, even though they're the most indebted generation ever in the U.S. Uh, they, they rate financial security fifth on their priority list behind uh, going to grad school, starting their own business, uh, having a positive personal experiences and, and sharing with others and doing social good. Uh, and they come into their jobs um, and, and the average length of time they stay in their first job is less than 18 months uh, because they're really looking for experiences. They're not looking uh, to achieve career goals or to get onto that ladder, that hierarchical ladder and uh, stepping uh, step by step up to uh, management and success. It's not the way they're, they're looking at their futures. They're, they're looking at life experiences, at learning, at gaining knowledge. Uh, at traveling. They're the most traveled generation ever, um, and they're, they're the most socially connected generation ever uh, through mobile and social networks. They, um, and, and they're motivated by uh, passion and by uh, doing things that, that are emotionally gratifying to themselves, that are, are socially positive and meaningful as opposed to, uh, to money. 
and and they also uh, really don't understand the, the the whole idea of hierarchy. So when they come into corporations and organizations and they're put into the little cubicle in the little box that and said, this is your job. They look around and say, well, I want to do that too. And I want to do that too. And by the way, the manager four steps up above me, I want to do what he or she is doing. Right. Um, and, and the, you know what? A lot of them are qualified to do those jobs. I have a, a 24 year old working well with me. She's been in my company for two years and uh, I promoted her six months ago uh, to a role of a gentleman who was in his fifties, who left, who was our research director. And, and, uh, I asked her to take that on when he left on an interim basis. And after a month, I realized she was doing it better than he'd been doing it with more amazing. creativity, more innovation, more ideas. Huh. And, uh, so she's now in that role and doing a oh. great job. At 24 years old. Jack, I'm going to ask you to hold that thought. Uh, We're going to take a quick break so we can give some love to our sponsor. Uh, In the next segment, everyone, Jack is going to share more about his book and, and give advice to younger women and men about their future. You have been listening to Women Worldwide with your host, Deirdre Breckenridge. Segment two is coming right up. Creating brand loyalty requires a unique blend of strategic communications and innovative technology. Pure Performance Communications works with businesses to move their audiences from interest to action, giving you a roadmap that fosters deeper engagement and forges stronger relationships along the way. Visit us at pureperformancecom.com. Thank you. Now, back to Women Worldwide with your host, Deirdre Breckenridge. I'm Deirdre Breckenridge. Welcome back to the show. I was just chatting with Jack Myers, who is the author of The Future of Men. Okay, Jack, let's let's get back to what we were chatting about. You had just mentioned um, a 24-year-old within your organization um, who you promoted six months ago to research director and what a fantastic job she's doing and the innovation and the ideas that she's bringing to the table. Yes. Uh, what's, what's really interesting is, um, I, as I've been doing, as I did my research, uh, for the future of men, I, I spoke to many men, many women, and a common thread I heard, uh, from women, especially from moms, moms of young boys in their, uh, teen, late teens, early twenties, even mid twenties. And they describe them as sitting on the couch, directionless. Uh, not really having the motivation, the direction, the guidance to go out and, and get a good job and that a lack of clarity. And, and that really concerns me because especially as I see the young women, uh, working with me and, and the young women working in so many companies, uh, and moving up the, uh, in, in getting these opportunities and, and, uh, d- destroying the hierarchy by, by being innovative and, and connected and smart and aggressive, assertive, um, and displaying many of the qualities we need for success today, which, which we can talk a bit about. Um, we're not, in many ways, we're not seeing that same kind of motivation or those same kind of skills and qualities among men. Um, young men, they are uh, confronted by this conflict. They are confused. They don't have that uh, that same empowerment uh, that that women have been get, uh, given, and we talked earlier about the the media and the how media has uh, impacted on both young men and young women, empowering young women, and I think in many ways holding young boys on their couch. Uh, they're gaming. They're uh, you know they're uh, they're, they're not. Uh, activating themselves in the world the same way that young women are. And I think that's a real concern that we need to address right now before, uh, if we want these young men to become uh, good, positive dads and uh, to be in positive relationships and to be um, uh, positive colleagues and uh, to be positive role models for future men and women. Uh, so this is my biggest concern, and that's really what I focus on in many ways in the future of men, just, just the realities of what we're confronting today, why those realities exist, and this huge shift in gender norms that's taking place in 
uh, economically, educationally, and in relationships today. So, Jack, that is a concern um, about young men who don't feel empowered if they're sitting on the couch, they're playing their video games, they're, they're staying in their room for far too many hours. Does that begin with the parents? What can the parents do to help that young man? Or is it beyond the parents? Is it something else that they need? That's a great question, Deirdre. And it depends on the parent. Uh, you know, it's interesting when, as I've been talking uh, over the last few years about writing and not having written and published a, a book called The Future of Men, a lot of uh, men who I've mentioned that to me, I'd, I'd say 70% of the, the men of all ages who I mentioned that to respond, oh, you mean we have a future? Uh, or, wow, that must be a short book. <laughs> and, oh, <no>. you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we laugh, but it, it really does reflect uh, the concerns uh, and, and it does reflect uh, the emotional disconnect uh, that so many men have in terms of uh, uh their realities and, and why it's no, it, it's, and, and it's really no laughing matter when, uh, when men question their future, they're being, they're, they're exposed to the media messages that empower women on the one hand, on the other hand, they're inundated with messages that demean and political messages that encourage them, encourage them to stand up, be a real man and fight back. So when it comes to, to parents, um, I think, you know, so many of them have had working mothers, uh, and working dads, and but they've been exposed to to dads who have grown up in in a patriarchal society, and as open as dads may be uh, uh, to uh, their wives working, uh, as open as dads may be to um, embracing uh, their daughters uh, and their the empowerment of the daughters they really haven't had the qualifications to guide men into this new world. There hasn't been uh, this kind of support that the women's movement has provided for moms to uh, provide their daughters with direction. Yeah. So uh, going forward, yes, you know, parents uh, can, can be a huge influence. And I think we're seeing in this younger generation of men and women that moms have been an incredibly positive force and direction, but men need the role models from men as well to help define themselves. And uh, while I have considered myself a, a good dad, I, I like to think of myself, or I certainly try to be a great granddad. Uh -huh. um, you know, I grew up in a patriarchy and, and I am part of a patriarchy. And um, uh, while I can look back and, and think I, uh, have tried to do all the right things. I, I recognize that I also in many ways showed my son uh, parts of, of me and, and my world and my life that have not been positive uh, guides for them. Uh, I don't think they've necessarily been negative influences, but uh, they also haven't been provided them with a guidebook as, as young girls have been given a guidebook uh, through the women's movement and as mothers have been given uh, a guidebook and uh, as female uh, employees and managers are, are being given a guidebook every day in their companies uh, from women's organizations and uh, groups that that are there uh, to support young women coming into the companies. Uh, young boys, young men come into companies and the young women they've gone to school with, grown up with, uh, go into women's groups and the guys sit there and say, well, what is there for me? Uh, what do I, you know, where do I go for support and help? Uh, and we don't have those organizations. No. Hey, Jack, maybe the, because there is no guidebook, maybe you'll write that guidebook. <laughs> well, that, actually, that that's where we're going with first five. Thank you. Uh, that's that's uh, the perfect segue. Uh, we do need better uh, assessment tools We uh, for talent. We do need better retention tools, leadership tools, training programs uh, that are multicultural and gender neutral in their approach uh, to the workforce. Uh, we do need uh, uh, new new types of organizations that I think are, will be grounded in the, in the established women's groups that are uh, already abundant today. Um, and, and I do believe that 
there are true opportunities for uh, developing online programs for young people that can provide the guidance, the direction, and the support they need. Oh, well, I know there's a, a lot to look forward to in the future, especially if these tools and, and resources come to fruition. Um, I'll tell you, Deirdre, I love this generation. That's just, yeah, that's, I do too. You know, I, I, I truly love them. I, I, I believe that because they have the sensibilities and sensitivities of the older millennials and the older generations, and because they're our first prism into the into the future generations, I, I think in in this small uh, six, seven, eight year generation, uh, we we really hold uh, our future. Uh, as we've seen in the in the Bernie Sanders campaign, this right. is a generation that's really prepared to step up, not like uh, we did in, I, you know, my generation did in the 60s with rebellion um, that then turned into a me generation, uh, but with true passion and, and with true focus on positive action and, and positive uh, support as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, con converting back into a uh, a rebellion, and yes, may you know we can question whether they'll hold on to their idealism, uh, but I believe they will, and I, because I believe they've learned how to activate their idealism online, and they now have the vehicle to communicate, whereas in the '60s, '70s, uh, we didn't. Yeah, that you make a great point. I um, I think this is the most passionate, sensitive. Um, and really a, a generation that wants to see change, um, I think that we should be investing so much in this generation. So giving you know, them the guidebook I, I, and the resources is yeah. critically important to our future. The word, the word change, obviously we've heard the word change you know, nonstop the last few months and, yes. and, and, the, and, and throughout the campaigns. Um, this generation's grown up with change. It's all they've known. Uh, disruption and instability is their norm. And I think what they really are seeking is stability. And uh, I think they're, they're, they'll bring a unique quality to uh, how they approach change by uh, really looking to be stabilizing forces in a positive construct as opposed to uh, change forces in, in a destructive uh, break it down before you can rebuild it. I, I think they'll build on, on the positives that we have and that they have. And, and they, I think they look at the world through uh, a different prism than we do. I think they mm -hmm. look at the world through uh, it's been so negative. Uh, let's hope that, that the way to change is to be positive. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Um, I want to step back a second. There was something that you had said about being a good dad and a good granddad as well. Um, from that perspective, as you were pulling together so much information, you know, for your book and, and all the research, was there anything personally that just stood out that was really surprising to you that you want to share? What was surprising uh most was the uh, the passion of women uh, for supporting young men, oh. uh, especially mothers, uh, but also girlfriends who are um, planning uh, marriages. Uh, what what didn't surprise me because I have uh, children are was were the. Uh, the positive qualities of this generation toward being multi uh, gen, uh, gender neutral, toward being uh, multi open, multiculturally, uh, toward uh, really not looking at the uh, the differences among us, but uh, looking for the common uh, mm -hmm. uh, common factors among us, looking at uh, the world through through a prism of measuring people by their creativity, their uh, their ideas and and their inspiration um, and their and their communication skills, um, but I would say the biggest uh, surprise uh, was as I've spoken to women. Uh, sure, there have been those women when I've said them, I've written a book about the future of men. They they say, wait a second, men. You know, we're not done talking about women. Uh, <laughs> let, let's we're not ready for you know to start worrying or being concerned about men. So. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, that is interesting. 
But I, I have to say, most of the women are, are like are like you, uh, really interested in understanding what's going on with men and knowing what they can do to to help, to reach out, to support young men, and to help make sure that their sons have a a positive world to go into and opportunities and are prepared for those opportunities and how the world can be more responsive to men. That, that's just been a, a, a wonderful eye opener. The, the women's organizations that are inviting me to speak and, and that are actually more open to my message. And what's also surprised me is a number of men's groups that have come out of the woodwork that are, um, that are, you know, have been hiding in, in church basements and uh, community centers on Sunday mornings, meeting with each other to help each other. And they're not necessarily the drum beating, uh, you know, get back to our uh, uh, tribal roots, uh, men's groups of which there are many, but it's men's groups that are encouraging men to open up about their their fears, to be vulnerable, to be emotionally open and encouraging men to go back home and bring that vulnerability in, into the home and to uh, feel free to express it and, and empowered by it. Um, we really need uh, that uh, both men supporting men and women supporting men and encouraging uh, that emotional openness, which uh, so many men have been taught from generation to generation to generation uh, to be closed emotionally. Uh, that that you know, it's the woman. Uh, if you cry, if you're emotionally open, then you're a, a sissy or a wuss. Uh, you're not right. a real man. Well, you know, it takes both men and women to make this happen. I've heard from the other side, the other perspective, when we talk about women and them moving forward and what they need to close the, the gender gap, that men have to be involved. So rightly so, it's wonderful when women can be helping men and men can be helping men, of course, too. Um, I'm just curious, do you have a favorite chapter in your book? Uh, well, <laughs> Um, the first four chapters are really of, of uh, the future of men are really designed to set the stage to to share the realities that we're confronting today to um, uh, to be open about where the, the context and, and the eyes through which I wrote the book um, and and then we move I move on and cover politics cover education cover business media advertising marketing uh, international and global issues. Uh, I look at uh, sexism and uh, gay rights, uh, LGBTQ um, rights. I talk about uh, will and grace and its impact on uh, society. Um, but I would say my, my favorite chapter is the deny, deny, deny. Oh, that's mine too. Delight. That's mine too. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why? One, like, Why? Oh, because it, it hit home so hard in, in different ways. The understanding and, I mean, really understanding where men get this from and, and why mm -hmm. and how you can see it in different areas of, of your life. It's really interesting. So that was a hard-hitting chapter. And, and the, you know, there's a lot of, in, in the first couple chapters especially and in the forward, there's, there's a lot of mea culpa. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, you know, in order to bring true honesty to this book and authenticity to it, I had to be open about um, my own reality, uh, the world I grew up with, the um, and and my um, my relationships and um, marriages and um, uh, work experiences and and the perspective and. Uh, um, and, and acknowledging that, you know, I, I was far from a, a perfect man, uh, in, in many ways, but, um, you know, as, as I wrote this book and, and began to see the, the damage and the danger in so many of the things that I was, were taught about what a man is, that, um, it, it's enabled me to, uh, have a completely new uh, perspective on relationships. I remarried uh, in January, and, and my relationship is radically different than uh, my prior ones, thanks to um, the, the knowledge I gained through, uh, uh, through writing this book and looking at this younger generation and really uh, understanding uh, 
the world that that they've been looking at and how damaging it's been and how damaging the patriarchy has been to me and uh, the work environment that I grew up in. Well, congratulations on your new marriage and Thank all you. of this. You're Thank welcome. You. And all of the knowledge and perspective, which there's so much in your book. So maybe well, now I wrote we can... it for my, I wrote it uh, for my, my grandsons. I mean, they're, uh, they're the ones who will benefit. So. That is <laughs> and granddaughter. wonderful. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, so with all this new knowledge, I think it's time to give some advice. Um, what advice would you give to older men? about their future, as well as younger men, or, you know, would it be the same? Would it be different? What, what would you say? Uh, well, I, first of all, I think all men have to really uh, reassess uh, our attitudes and, and understand um, the definition of, of uh, objectification and sexism, uh, the definitions of um, uh, sexual addiction, uh, which are um, more uh, defined today as personal intimacy disorder, uh, the struggles that um, so many men have with uh, bringing real intimacy into their relationships, um, and, and to, to really uh, put ourselves through a self-education course on intimacy and, uh, and vulnerability. Uh, but it, So it's self-evaluation. But frankly, I think for, for many men, you know, especially, you know, over 30 and, and even and the older we get, the, the, the more difficult it is to really do a fair self-evaluation and to change our ways. So I think number one is rather than, you know, looking inward, but then using it to change our attitudes in the workforce and the family with our sons and daughters, um, to, to change our attitudes toward them and how they're living their lives and what they're looking for, to recognize that they're not following the same career paths as we did, uh, that they have different political points of view than many of us do, and to embrace and accept in them who they are rather than trying to impose on them who, who we are and who we've been. Uh, we need to certainly change our uh, our focus on media, and I think we all need to stand up and start rejecting advertising and media messages that denigrate and demean men. Uh, just as we encourage positive images of women, we need to encourage positive images of, of giving dads, of dads in roles that have been traditionally female, like teachers and nursing nurses. Uh, we need to, um, uh, the government really is responsible for, uh, I think, economic incentives and tax relief for, uh, to bring fathers back into their homes. Uh, we need coherent policies to release and educate uh, young men who are, you know, in, inappropriately imprisoned. We need to be more supportive of extended maternity and paternity leave. And I think every man and every woman in a corporate role uh, should be insisting on and encouraging extended maternity and paternity leave. Yes. Uh, we need, you know, and, and if, if, you're, if you're at a party and you meet a guy who's a stay-at-home dad, First of all, stop asking the question automatically to a man, what do you do for a mm -hmm. living? And if we do ask that and they say, I'm a, well, I'm a stay-at-home dad, don't assume that means he's an out-of-work dad. Um, it means he's a stay-at-home dad. And hug him. Be positive yeah. and say, congratulations. What a great opportunity you must have. I would have loved or I would love to be home more with my uh, with my kids to positively and reinforce that as opposed to making assumptions of uh, him not being a real man. Um, we, we need, you know, the democratic platform has called for uh, uh, free education for middle and lower income people, a college education, reduced college debt programs. These are extremely important. Uh, we should give their charities in my industry, the, on the organization Advertising Women of New York supports uh, college uh, loan relief programs. Uh, we need to start and support those kinds of programs in our communities. Um, most importantly, I think within uh, corporations and organizations, we really need to uh, look at the women's established women's groups and programs and find ways to incorporate young men. When, when young people join organizations, 
out of college uh, and, and they've grown up in a gender neutral society and then they get come into their first jobs and it's all, okay, women over here, men over here. Right. Um, that makes no sense to them. Uh, so we need to break down all these uh, uh, barriers that we've created that are hierarchical um, and, and, you know, women, you know, women here, men there that we're, we're not different in, in this younger generation. They're the same there. And while there are certainly gender, core gender differences um, in the workplace, uh, we need to create integration, not segregation. And it's the same thing in families, you know, if a little, if a little boy's on the field, um, you know, and, and crying because he fell down and got hurt, don't run up to him and say, it's okay, it's okay, big boys don't cry. No, right. big, big boys do cry. And it's okay to cry. So, you know, just rethink our, uh, what we say and what we do and how we approach their world. Definitely a lot of rethinking, many things to do. Uh, I truly believe this is the generation and the future that will do it. And as long as all of the older generations of men and women keep a very open mindset, uh, we can do a lot together. So last question for you. Where can my listeners find out more about you and your book, The Future of Men? Well, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> uh, Futureofmen.com. Uh, the book is available at Amazon, uh, in many bookstores. Uh, ask for it if it's in your independent bookstore, local bookstore, if they don't have it. Uh, all, all the online sites that sell books. And, um, and then you, they can also find out a little bit more about me and some of the things we're doing in the, in the positive social good area, mediavillage.com. Uh, where we uh, we've begun uh, conversations uh, under the women advancing dot org, uh, future of men dot com, uh, legends and leaders, and uh, other init- first five initiative, first five dot org. That's one s t five f i v e dot com dot org. I'm sorry that focuses on supporting and helping young people in the first five years of their career. But future of men dot com is where it all comes together. Fantastic. Jack, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives on the future of men, your insights in your book, which was excellent. I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Deirdre, I can't thank you enough for inviting (laughs) me. It's been fun and, and I really value the opportunity. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And I want to also thank all of you for tuning into Women Worldwide. Until our next episode, stay focused, energized and feeling empowered. Thank you. You have been listening to Women Worldwide with Deirdre Breckenridge, brought to you by Pure Performance Communications on the socialnetworkstation.com. You can reach Pure Performance at www.pureperformancecom.com. Women Worldwide is produced by SNI, and the opinions of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect those of Social Network Intermedia, LLC, or the Social Networks.